Uh, what I hope that you'll get by the end of this talk is an understanding or at least a, a better appreciation of the fact that the extracellular matrix in Dupuytren's disease is not some kind of passive environment in which uh, Dupuytren's disease cells grow. Uh, it's in fact an active component of this uh, disease and I would like to try and convince you that we think that it's actually a, a mediator of disease progression and potentially recurrence. And so I guess from a chemotherapeutic potential, um, and obviously there are some examples which are doing this, but I think we should be maybe thinking about targeting the ECM and maybe not targeting Dupuytren's disease cells if we were to come up with an effective treatment for this condition. Um, so the Dupuytren's disease ECM, why look at it? Well, comparative gene expression analyses from many laboratories, many of them have actually been performed by people in this room, such as Dr. Bayat's group and many others, uh, our group, quite a few others, have consistently identified large numbers of genes encoding extracellular matrix proteins. And as um, the uh, first speaker very kindly um, gave us a, a good background on collagens. Uh, they, of course, are markedly upregulated uh, as, as a laminins, a uh, variety of secreted extracellular matrix proteases. Uh, I'm going to be speaking about one today, which is antisyntricin and metalloprotease 12, um, which is consistently seen, well, at least in many of the published studies, to be upregulated in this arrays. Um, matricellular molecules such as tenations and periostin. We've done quite a bit of work on periostin. Um, just, I guess, to give you, to define that term, matricellular molecules such as these are molecules that are secreted into the ECM but are less than structural components. They actually act as interacting components between the cells and the ECM. So they modify the cell signals that Dupuytren's disease cells get from their surrounding environment. And that's a very particular, and let's say, a focus of our laboratory. Um, of course, as Boris Hines very well pointed out, and, and others, altered ECM stiffness, mechanical stress, modify um, mechanoreceptor activation in the particularly myofibroblast. Um, there's been studies done by Dr. Gabbiani's group show that, uh, for example, tensile growth factor beta 1 activation can occur through stress. So there's a variety of ECM mediated components in this disease, and we've actually hypothesized that it's the ECM that is probably the major promoter of disease progression, and recently published that. So, do, why, you know, these disease cells are particularly sensitive to their ECM, and I guess this is maybe the point I really want to drive home. <coughs> Our group was the first to note that beta-catenin levels are upregulated in Dupuytren's disease relative to the adjacent part of the fascia, that's both in tissue sections as well as in cells and culture. Um, the relevance of that is when you take the cells in culture and you grab them on a plastic dish, which is what so many people do and what I would really like people to stop doing, um, <laughs> is um, they the beta continuum levels are rapidly altered by the culture substrate that they put them on, unlike part of what I refer to as PF cells here. And what I mean by PF cells are fiber cells, primary fibroblasts derived from the same patients from probably a centimetre away or so, but it's phenotypically normal fascia. So these are genetically matched controls. But their ability to regulate beta continuum levels is markedly different. And we published that a little while ago now. Um, more recently, we've been working on periostin as a set of matricellular molecule, um, and it can differentially regulate whether the cells grow, whether the cells undergo apoptosis, or undergo myofibroblast differentiation, again, in these genetically identical, as far as we know, cells, just that one's derived from Dupuytren's disease, and the other one's derived from phenotypically unaffected part of fascia from the same patients. Now, if we have lots of ECM molecules that are, that are upregulated, I guess one of the questions we've been asking in, in my lab is, why? What's, what's the point? Why, why are we changing the ECM to such an extent? And of course there are many reasons, but we decided to test two not exactly exclusive but somewhat overlapping hypotheses. One which we call the cell migration hypothesis. And I think this is kind of a, a common perception of, of how Dupuytren's disease may progress. And this is, you'll excuse my lousy cartoon skills, but this is the best I can do. Um, so. Uh, for some reason that none of us understand as yet, a nodule forms in or on adjacent to the palm of fascia. And this nodule um, develops some kind of uh, migratory ability and it migrates on down the fascia and the cells differentiate and um, as they go along they, um, of course, are fibroblasts and they interact with the, with the fascia and they contract it and so you end up with a cord. Well, that's, that's all very good, but there are some predictions of this hypothesis. One would be that not nodule cells are therefore migratory and can populate the adjacent palmar fascia. Another would be that cord cells are direct descendants of nodule cells because if the simple nodule has the start and they've all just grown out from that, then they should be direct descendants. And thirdly, that the ECM modification by nodule cells might be doing many things, but one of the things it could obviously be doing 
is to facilitating nodule cell migration. So we thought we'd test that. So we tested it um, with, you've heard a lot about um, FPCLs, fibroblast populated collagen lattices, and we do them, and we've been doing them for 10 years now. Um, we thought we'd kind of modify the system a little bit, and, and this, and I guess I'm lucky in the sense that I get paid to kind of think up in, you know, interesting and fun things to do in the laboratory, and then I get my students to do it. So um, the, uh, what we thought we'd do was we get stressed FPCLs, and we stress them for 72 hours, I stand them, allow them to differentiate into myofibroblast, release them for 24 hours, all the standard stuff. And then we actually pulled them out and put them on, a, on a, a, another culture dish. And this culture dish had been pre-coded in type 1 collagen, plus or minus some of the extracellular matrix molecules that had been previously identified in some of those gene arrays. And we thought, well, let, let's see if these cells can sort of migrate out of a stressed FPCL into that, col that cell-free collagen around them. And let's see if these ECM molecules make a difference to how well they can do that. And then we can assess that using microscopy. We tried a few different microscopy methods. We tried um, differential interference contrast, and I guess the relevance of this uh, picture here as a sense is that yes, I can see the end of the FPCL, and yes, the cells do migrate out into the cell free collagen, which is a good thing. Um, and we can also do that with sort of standard uh, phylloid and staining for stress fiber actin, and the little blue dots are a nuclei, but you get a rather two dimensional perception <coughs> doing this. So we actually went to stereo microscopy, and as much as they don't make quite as good a slide for you to look at, what it means that we could actually measure cells, look again by DAPI staining, but we could do it in relatively three dimensions, so we get a little, quite a lot of focal depth doing it this way. And so I guess the first thing we did was just test duplicitous disease cells and what I would call PF cells from the same patients, from multiple patients, to see what's their inherent migratory ability in the system. And the answer is the duplicitous disease cells are less migratory than their genetically matched palmofascia controls. So then we thought, okay, well TGF beta, everybody talks about TGF beta being associated with duplicitous disease, let's try that. So we put 12.5 mg per mil sort of physiologically relevant dose of TGF beta into these cells did the same thing, and there was no consistent effect on migration, although it was much more variable than we would have liked. Um, we appreciate that um, doing cell counts in three-dimensional models on a stereo microscope is incredibly time-consuming and um, frustrating, which is why I get my students to do it. Um, so, uh, whereas compared to palmar fascia, we, we see actually an inhibition if we put TGFB1 in the surrounding collagen compared to fecal treated cells. We also looked at um, uh, ADAM12, a synagrin metalloprotease 12, a, a, a Protease, which is consistently seen to be upregulated in the Dubinus disease ECM, um, and it also uh, inhibited Dubinus disease migration and inhibited uh, palmofascia cell migration. In some uh, related studies, we were looking at this molecule, and we have uh, an article in press, well, in, not in press yet, an article hopefully that will soon be in press, um, looking at what the effects of ADAM12 in Dubinus disease. And um, one of the things it does is it induces proliferation in Dubinus disease cells, but not. Um, PF cells, again, a cell-specific effect. Um, so we thought, maybe we better pre-treat these guys with mitomycin to see and stop their ability to proliferate, because then we can just find out whether it's just affecting migration or not. So we did that, and to our great surprise, when you stop them proliferating, they now have a migration rate which is the same as normal. Now, I've been scratching my head around that, about that one for quite a while. If anyone can come up with a good reason for that, please let me know. Um, the other one, another molecule we looked at was periostin, again, uh, physiologically relevant concentration, periostin again being this matricellular molecule. Um, and it had no significant statistical effect on, on migration in either um, PF or DD cells. Um, it does make PF cells grow, but not DD cells grow. It makes different disease cells differentiate in myofibroblasts. So we tried a mitomycin C treatment, and as you can see, when you stop the cells from growing, it actually inhibits their migration. So the data so far, uh, we assessed their 3D migration in all of these molecules, and we really saw no effect or reduced 3D migration of these cells compared to their palmar fascia mass controls. So that doesn't really support the hypothesis. So we thought maybe we'd come up with another one. And that was the ECM-mediated disease hypothesis, and it kind of runs something like this. You start off with the same old nodule, but now, instead of these cells migrating along the fascia, they just secrete molecules into the ECM. And those molecules secreted into the ECM stimulate the adjacent phenotypically normal palmar fascia cells to undergo differentiation into Dubrovnik's disease cells. And then essentially, they form another little nodule, and then another one. And they go on and on and spread through the fascia that way. We thought, mm, that might be a good way to say it. Let's, let's see what the, what the uh, consequences of that might be. And of course, then you can track the cord. So some consequences of that, secretions of these cells into the ECM should be able to induce resident fibroblasts to take on duplicitous disease cell characteristics. Um, cord cells are therefore not direct descendants <coughs> of nodule cells because they've come via the ECM to palmar fascia, which is an interesting consequence. 
Um, and so obviously a conditioned ECM should be able to do this to these cells. So we thought we'd try that out as well. So again, I came up with some tricky little idea about how to do this. We got our standard trans well and we filled it up with enough collagen to just nicely embed the trans well in type 1 collagen. Uh, the cells, Dubin's disease cells or PF cells, uh, were sitting on the, top, on the top of the membrane here, so they're unable to escape, but they are actually embedded in the collagen so they can secrete anything that they would normally secrete into the ECM into that collagen. We allow them to do that for seven days, and then we remove this thing. Now, of course, they can secrete factors into the media as well as into the collagen, so we fix that by changing the media. And so then we put nice fresh media in here, and then we get patient matched palmar fascia cells, put them back on this now conditioned collagen substrate, and we allow those to grow for seven days, and then ask the question, for example, does cytoplasmic beta-catenin accumulation change? As you remember, upregulated cytoplasmic beta-catenin levels is one of the things that we first noted in Dubitin's disease cells. So we've done this experiment a few times now, and this is the answer. Palmar fascia cells growing on collagen conditioned by palmar fascia cells express virtually no beta-catenin, which is what we standardly see when we grow cells in collagen for more than seven days. Palmar fascia cells grow on, on collagen conditioned by Dubin's disease cells have a marked upregulation of beta-catenin compared to the palmar fascia controls. And if down here we have beta-actin controls to show you that I did actually know the same amount of protein in each well. We went on to then look, that's why you need uh, fluorescent immunochemistry. Um, again, not only do we see changes in beta-catenin accumulation, but we actually see changes in stress fibre um, condensation in these cells. So this is just phylloidin staining for stress fibre actin. And the stress fibre actin levels, these are the same palmar fascia cells, one cultured on collagen conditioned by palmar fascia cells, this growing on collagen conditioned by Dubin's disease cells. And these cells are cells of change phenotype, and they also have upregulated beta-catenin, which you can sort of see is the origin in the um, area just uh, around the nucleus of these cells. So in conclusion, 3D migration of Dubinin's disease cells is either unaffected or inhibited by at least the factors that we've checked so far. Dubinin's disease cells, but not their patient matched palmar fascia controls, again, to emphasise genetically matched controls, can condition a collagen substrate with factors that induce beta catenin accumulation in palmar fascia cells. I can add, they also change stress fibre actin condensation of these cells. So our data support an ECM mediated disease hypothesis, but not the cell migration hypothesis. And a conditioned ECM just might drive Dubinin's disease progression. So current and future experiments, I wanted, of course, the very next thing to do is to see what genes are, are actually dysregulated in these guys growing in a Dubinin's disease um, altered environment because that can give us lots of information about what sort of differenti differentiation pathways these cells go through. Um, we just started these studies and then a real-time PCR machine went down for a month, so unfortunately I don't need data for you. I intended to have some, but that was the way it goes. Um, but we'll have some very soon. And of course, uh, as uh, Boris is always telling me, I need to input sort of stress and sort of matrix things into my experiments as well, and I intend to do that. So we have a little flex cell unit, which we're now going to get conditioned collagen and put them under stress and see what effects that can do have on their gene expression and, uh, and protein regulation. So I'd just like to thank the people who actually did this experiment, which was uh, Linda V in my lab and uh, Dr. Ian Wu is my technician. <laughs> Uh, Bing Gan for sage advice as always, and the rest of the uh, Gorman Laboratory. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Gorman. That was a wonderful.